Another sunny day on the beach. You know, they say if you're out in the sun a lot, you should protect yourself. You should wear sunscreen to protect your skin against sunburn. You should wear sunglasses to protect your eyes. You should cover your skin as much as possible if you're out for a long time and wear something fashionable like this. Oh, and you should also wear a hat. Hi, I'm Bob McDonald. Have you ever wondered why you can't go to the beach without looking like a goof? Okay, so there are better ways of protecting yourself, but it is really important to protect yourself against the sun because it's more than just hot. Its rays can do serious damage to your body. So keep your heads up, because we're going to find out why the sun is so hot. The sun is an unimaginably hot and violent place. 6,000 degrees on the outside, 15 million on the inside. There's no place like it on Earth. Unless you like living inside a nuclear bomb. Because that's exactly what the sun is. A huge nuclear bomb that never stops exploding. That's why it's so hot. On this program, we'll find out why it doesn't blow itself up. You want to see my imitation of the first man on the sun? That's one small step for man. Ah, 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 ah. Hot, 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 hot. Okay, okay. We obviously won't be sending astronauts to the sun. They'd burn up long before they even got there. But it is important to study the sun because it affects everything down here on Earth. I mean, if the sun went out today, the Earth would freeze in an instant and nothing could live here. But there's a problem trying to study the sun. You can't look at it, at least with your eyes and that includes when you're wearing sunglasses. I mean, think about what it can do to your skin. You get sunburn, you get blisters. No, I'd rather not be peeling my eyeballs, thank you very much. But fortunately, there are ways to study the sun safely using very specialized instruments. I know, I know, I look a little different now. That's because through the magic of television, I've been transported to the top of a mountain in Arizona where they have some rather uh, clever instruments that study the sun. There are a number of different ways that scientists can do this. Sometimes they put strong filters over the front of a telescope to protect their eyes. They have telescopes that can look inside the sun. We have orbiting spacecraft that can look at the sun's atmosphere. And we even have one robot that's going to try to sample a piece of the sun itself. But you know, there's another reason to study the sun. It's more than just a big hot ball of gas in the sky that keeps us warm. It's a star. And it's the only star in the entire universe that we can actually see as a ball. And we can see all that activity on its surface. No matter how big your astronomical telescope is, if you look at any other star in the sky, it's always a little tiny dot. So by studying the face of the sun, we're actually looking at the other stars in the universe. The first thing you notice when you look at the sun through a solar telescope is that it's covered in black spots. The sun has zits on its face. Those solar zits are called sunspots. In reality, they're giant storms, some of them larger than the entire Earth. They're not really black. They're just not as bright as the rest of the sun, so they look darker. If you took a sunspot off the sun and looked at it all by itself, it would be too bright to look at with your eyes. They just look dark on the bright face of the sun. These spots have been known for centuries, and they let us watch the sun turn. By the way, one day on the sun is about 27 Earth days. Of course, it never gets dark there. Here at the world's largest solar telescope, scientists can study those sunspots in incredible detail, and they do it in a really neat way. Up on the roof of this unusual looking building is a giant mirror. Uh, it's very much like this, just a big flat mirror that reflects sunlight down a long shaft. And at the bottom of the shaft is a big screen and they get an image of the sun, something like this, except a lot better. And that lets the scientists study those sunspots and see those storms in exquisite detail. Those spots are evidence of the violent activity taking place inside the sun. 
Scientists watch them grow and disappear the way storms come and go on Earth. Sunspots are like the weather on the sun, except it's always bad there. Here's a simple demonstration you can try in the wintertime to show how pressure generates heat. If you just make a little snowball and then keep packing it, just keep really, really pressing on it. Put lots of pressure with your hands on that snow, and you'll find, if you do this enough, that the pressure from your hands melts the snow and forms it into a little ice ball because the pressure has generated heat and caused that snow to melt a little bit. You can see how my hand is all wet here. That's what's going on inside the sun. It's so huge, the pressure is tremendous, and it generates temperatures of hundreds of millions of degrees, enough for nuclear reactions to take place, which is a whole lot more than I can do with my hands. <laughs> On the edge of a lake in the mountains of California, there's a white dome housing another kind of telescope for studying the sun. It's called the Big Bear Solar Observatory. As telescopes go, it's not very big, but you don't need a big telescope to look at the sun. After all, it is our closest star. In fact, the scientists here have to dump some of the sunlight onto the wall because it's too bright for the cameras. This is actually three telescopes in one. And each one of them is designed to look at a different aspect of the sun in close-up detail. Hmm. It's just starting to boil now. You know, another funny thing about the sun is when you look at its surface really closely, and you're not looking at sunspots, but all the rest of the sun, you see what looks like boiling soup. Look what's happening to my soup now. Can you see how it's boiling up in a couple of places? It's coming up here and it's coming up there. The heat from underneath is welling up and boiling out to, through the surface. But you can also see in the middle here, it's not going up. In fact, right along this line in the center, it's actually going down. And that's exactly what you see when you look at the surface of the sun. These bubbles on the surface of the sun are called granules because they kind of look like grains of rice. The granules seem small, but that's only because they're so far away. You could drop all of Canada into one of those grains. The energy that's inside the sun tries to blow everything outwards, but it only goes so far before something starts to pull it back down again. That's something that's preventing the sun from blowing up is its own gravity. And it works something like this. When you blow up a balloon, you create pressure on the inside that's pushing outwards, making the balloon bigger and bigger. That's what happens inside the sun. The sun's gravity is pulling inwards against that pressure to prevent it from getting too big, the same way that the rubber of this balloon is preventing the air from the inside from pushing out too far. So when the force outwards equals the force inwards, everything is in balance, and the sun just burns happily away, just like this balloon is happy to just sit here. The sun's been doing that for four and a half billion years, and we hope it's gonna keep doing that for another four and a half billion years. Oops. <laughs> Left the stove on here, sorry. But where's that energy coming from? Where is that energy coming from that can get all the way to us here on the Earth, 150 million kilometers away? Well, to find out that, we have to go deep inside the sun. And to do that, we got to ring the sun's bell. <laughs> Believe it or not, the sun does ring like a bell. John Leibacher listens to the sounds of the sun's ringing to find out what's going on deep inside the sun. I visited his odd-looking telescope called Gong. Welcome to the Gong site. Yeah, thank you. This is a very odd-looking thing. What is it? Uh, solar telescopes all look different. Uh -huh. uh, nighttime telescopes, you know, you're used to seeing them in a big dome and they all look sort of the same. Solar telescopes almost all look different. Well, there are actually six more like exactly like this one, so that's uh -huh. the exception. This is a, a gong shelter. Uh -huh. uh, Gong's the Global Oscillation Network Group, and what we do is look at the sun continuously. The sun never sets on Gong, and so during the day, the sun's just set here, but at sunrise it'll be looking like this and during the day, it'll rotate around and follow the sun until we get to sunset. And every one of these just sort of hands off and passes the baton to the one to the west. So the sun's just setting here in Tucson. Uh, the sun's just rising in India. 
And so in between, we have two more sites, and each one of them watches the sun. Oh, so they're all the way around the world. sunrise to sunset. All the way around the world. So how do you use this thing to look inside the sun? Looking is an interesting, interesting concept. What we're doing is uh, listening inside the sun. Listening? Listening. Uh, it's very much like uh, seismology, terrestrial seismology here on the Earth. We can't, like earth, see, we can't see inside the sun. Yeah. And so just like there are earthquakes, there are sunquakes. What we can do is look at the surface of the sun, and that's why we have a telescope here, a little bit like you were looking at the surface of a drum. Okay. You can see the drum vibrating. Okay even if you can't hear it. And what we do with the, the surface of the sun is we see the surface of the sun oscillating up and down uh, just like a, like a drum head. That's what science is all about, making a measurement and making an inference from that measurement. Okay, so, so how do those, those vibrations on the surface of the sun tell you what's going on inside the sun? An easy way to imagine how we can infer what's going inside the sun is just thinking about this, this glass of water. Uh, if we hit it, we hear a tone. Yeah. If I drink some of the water, ooh, we get a different tone. We get a different tone. <laughs> wow. And so even if I'm standing in front of the glass, and you can't see it, uh -huh. you can tell that I drunk and took some of the water out. Ah, hot. You know, there's a funny thing about the sun. It turns just like the Earth does, but it doesn't do it in the same way. The Earth is a solid ball of rock, and it all turns at once. But the sun is a ball of gas, so some parts of it actually turn faster than other parts. And I can show you here with my soup. Let's imagine that the two handles here are the north and the south pole of the sun, and the equator runs across the middle. Now, if you watch as I stir the soup, you can see that the middle part can move while the two poles don't move very much. And that's what happens on the sun. The equator actually moves faster than the poles. Scientists believe that this difference in speed between the poles and the equator is responsible for some of the twisted storms and sunspots we see on the sun's surface. Now, not all stars are like our sun. Some of them are smaller and blue, and some of them are red and big, a lot bigger. Let me show you what I mean. If you look up into the night sky in winter, you'll see a big constellation called Orion the Hunter. Orion's easy to spot even in a city. His body is a tall rectangle of stars with three stars marking his belt. At the top left of the rectangle is a bright star that looks different from the others. It has a distinct reddish color. It's called Betelgeuse. Below Orion is a brilliant star that looks kind of bluish. It's called Sirius the Dog Star. <laughs> Orion the Hunter has a dog. Sirius, by the way, is the brightest star in our sky. Now look closely and you'll see that these two stars really are two different colors. And both stars are bigger than the sun. Betelgeuse, the red one, is what our sun will look like in the future. Remember those forces that are keeping the sun from blowing itself apart? The pressure inside pushing out and the force of gravity pulling in? Right now, they're both in balance, but eventually the sun will run out of gas, stop burning inside and lose that pressure. Gravity will take over and start to squeeze the sun into a smaller and smaller ball of gas. But rather than deflate the sun like a balloon, that inward squeezing will make the center of the sun even hotter than it was before. A new kind of nuclear burning will start that will push the surface of the sun much farther out than it was before, turning our nice yellow star into a swollen red giant. Now, if anybody's watching when that happens, it'll be quite a sight to see the sun grow in the sky. It'll get bigger and redder. In fact, it'll fill the entire sky because the Earth will be right inside it. Goodbye to any life on this planet. Of course, we don't have to worry too much about that because it's not going to happen for another four billion years. Uh, so don't worry, the sun should rise tomorrow morning. The sun may not be ready to swallow the Earth just yet, but it still throws things at us. Enormous storms on the sun's surface are violent enough to eject huge blobs of hot gas out into space. 
These electrically charged, high-speed clouds can blow right over the Earth, causing electrical problems here on the ground. It's hard to believe that storms on the sun can cause problems down here on Earth, but it all has to do with magnetism. Uh, we know that the Earth is really just a big magnet. It's got a field around it. Now, when these storms from the sun hit the Earth, they cause the Earth's magnetic field to shake. It moves up and down, it wobbles back and forth. Meanwhile, down here on the ground, we have wires, uh, like this coil of wire here. It might be wires that are inside our computers or our satellites, or maybe they're these big, long wires that you see running across the countryside carrying power. Now, I've got this coil of wire hooked up to a meter here that records how much electricity is in the wire. There's nothing happening at the moment, but watch what happens when I move the magnet it generates electricity. Just by moving the magnet over the coil, we're generating electricity in those wires. If the magnet stops, the electricity stops. When the magnet moves, the electricity's there. So when these solar storms wiggle the magnetic field of the Earth, it causes extra electric currents to be created in these wires. That current shouldn't be there. That's what trips the circuit breakers, and you get a power blackout. Solar storms have blown out electronics on satellites, affected spacecraft on Mars, and even caused power blackouts on the ground. Have you ever wondered why radio telescopes and satellite dishes have that particular shape? Well, Ken Taffig and I are going to do a little demonstration out in the field to show how they work. You go that way, I'll go this way. Right, see Bye. ya. Now, this is a smaller version of the big one. It's a dish that has a very special shape called a parabolic dish. Now, we have two of them. I'm standing beside one, and Ken is way down there in another one. Hi, Ken. Hi. <laughs> now, he's actually out of earshot right now, but these dishes have a, a shape so that anything that hits the dish, whether it's radio waves from space or sound waves, or if we put a mirror on here, light, everything that hits the dish gets focused to one spot. And this ring right here is called the focal point. So anything that hits will will end up here. It's like amplifying it. And Ken can speak to us just using a normal voice. So Ken, can you say hello but speak into your dish? And I'm going to put this microphone right here at the focal point and let's see if we can hear him. Yes, of course, Bob. Testing. One, two, three. Over. Isn't that amazing? Just speaking in a normal voice. Now we can also go the other way. Anything that starts here will bounce off the dish and form a beam going out that way so I can talk to Ken. How's it going, Ken? No problem at all. The parabolic dish, that's why all telescopes have this fundamental shape. Okay, so back to our story. Ken uses those kinds of radio telescopes to tune into the sun and listen for approaching storms. In fact, the sun is sort of like a giant radio station that's broadcasting to the Earth. If we want to pick up that station, we use a receiver like this one, which is actually tracking the sun right now. When we listen to the radio waves, we listen to the sun breathing and pulsating, and we see how it changes from one day to the next. Well, what is happening, uh, along with other people around the world, is as soon as the sun comes up, we start recording the strength of the radio emissions coming from the sun. And these antennas track the sun all day, recording the strength of those signals. Um, well, when these magnetic fields get stressed out and finally they snap, uh, the, in this big snap, which releases the energy of a few million hydrogen bombs, um, particles are accelerated to almost the speed of light. There are great big pulses of X-rays and radio waves, which we can pick up here. And so we can actually pick up the lift-off point of this huge explosion, which catapults great chunks of the sun into space at up to 1,000 kilometres a second, because these things called coronal mass ejections are major causes of problems here on Earth. So we can actually see the bomb go off, if you like. You can see how closely we're tied to the sun whenever you watch the northern lights or aurora borealis. These eerie bands of green, blue, and red light that seem to hang in the sky are caused by charged particles from the sun hitting our air and causing it to glow. When there are storms in the sun, you can be sure that there will be even more spectacular northern lights in the sky. Actually, they happen in the south as well. The auroras form a halo around the top and the bottom of the Earth a halo that's created by the Earth's magnetic field.
Now these particles that come from the sun have an electric charge to them, so you can think of them as electricity passing through the gases in our atmosphere, making them glow. But we do this here on the ground all the time with neon signs. And Lynn, who made up these lovely tubes for us, could you turn these on for us? Hmm. You get different colors of signs, just like you get different colors in the northern lights. Now, the most common color you see in the sky is green, and that's because most of our atmosphere is made of nitrogen. So nitrogen will give you a green color, but we also have oxygen in our air, which is what we breathe. Oxygen gives you red, and there's a mixture of other gases in the atmosphere that'll give you blues and purples. Now, because our atmosphere is always moving around, and these particles from the sun are streaming like a river, everything moves, causing the the northern lights to seem to dance and change colors in the sky. But when you see a neon sign down here on the ground, you're seeing a similar process that's happening up in the sky and powered by the sun. The best way to study the sun is from space. One recent solar mission called Genesis was sent out to capture a piece of the sun and bring it back to Earth. Well, not an actual piece of the sun itself. Those particles blowing off the surface of the sun that make northern lights on Earth blow through space like a wind. In fact, scientists call it the solar wind. Genesis was sent on a long, looping orbit around the sun with special collectors to capture some of these particles. Then it returned to Earth, and it was supposed to come down by parachute and be snagged out of the air by helicopters so the precious cargo would not be damaged. Unfortunately, the parachutes didn't open and the space capsule crashed to the ground. The scientists had to sift through the wreckage to try to salvage what they could. Sometimes science is a tough business. times sailing on the free energy of the wind you know that one day it'll be possible to sail in space it's an idea that's been around for a long time and it uses the same principle that my boat does here the wind hits the sails bounces off to them and gets blown to the back the boat goes the other way wind goes one way boat goes in the opposite direction action reaction well if you want to sail in space your sails are going to be made of this stuff Open up a potato chip bag and you'll notice the, the inside of it is really shiny. Imagine a piece of plastic like this that's the size of a small town. It's several kilometers on a side. Now you fold it up into a really small space, you put it on a rocket, you launch it up into orbit, and then you unfurl it. And then you could sail to the moon, you could sail to Mars. Now you're probably saying, well, there's no wind in space, there's no air to blow on the sail and make it move, and you'd be exactly right. But this sail is pushed by sunlight. Scientists have known for years that sunlight exerts a small force when it hits a mirror. It's a really tiny force, but if you have a sail that's big enough, and if it's floating weightless in space, the sunlight will make the sail go faster and faster. In space, the sun is always shining, so the sail is always speeding up. Engineers have dreamed of giant solar sails cruising to the moon or Mars silently drifting on the free energy of the sun. These sails would be so large, you could see them from the ground. Imagine a whole fleet of these solar sailors, each one a different color. You could have a whole race to the moon, and everybody on Earth would just have to look up from their backyards and see who's winning. I want to be captain of one of those ships. <laughs> You 
know, the sun is a really fascinating place, but it's something that you cannot look at with your eyes. Even if you're wearing sunglasses, you can never look at the sun with your eyes because it'll do damage. So here are a couple of ways you can observe the sun without looking at it directly. One of them is called a pinhole camera, and all you need is a box. A shoe box works really well. And using a pen or a pin, make a small hole in one end. I just use my pen tip here to make a little hole in one end, and then you turn your back to the sun, hold the box over your head, and point the hole towards the sun, and if you adjust the box around a little bit, you will see a bright dot on the inside. And believe it or not, that's actually an image of the sun. And if you happen to be fortunate to see a partial eclipse of the sun, you can actually watch it happen this way very, very safely without using your eyes to look at the sun directly. Now, there's another way you can do it. Again, you keep your back to the sun using a pair of binoculars. You never look through the binoculars at the sun, but you do it indirectly. So with the sun over your shoulder and a white piece of paper here, Hold the, the binoculars up so that you can see their shadow on the paper and then just adjust them around until you see two really bright dots like that. And believe it or not, that is an image of the sun. And if we just focus it here and get it nice and sharp, sometimes you can see little dark spots in those images and those are sunspots on the surface of the sun. It also helps if you mount your binoculars on a tripod or, or put them on the edge of a, a rock or something so that they're nice and steady and then they won't jerk around like they are here in my hands. But that's one or two ways to look at the sun through instruments without using your eyes. Now, of course, if you don't want to use either one of these ways, there's another way to look at the sun. Go to a computer. Fortunately for us, there are a number of satellites that are looking at the sun for us, and you can see them on the internet at a number of websites. This is one called SOHO, and let's just have a look here at the best of SOHO. Solar and Heliospheric Observatory, it's called. It's being run by the European Space Agency. And let's look at this image right there, which is what the sun looks like to a satellite. And look at how violent it is. You see those white spots there are huge flares that are burning up and blowing stuff out towards us. You can see giant eruptions on the side there, the big flares flames and to give you an idea of how big the sun really is just back up one and let's look at another image this one here called gif look at that there's the size of the earth just for comparison if you could put the earth beside the sun that's how big it is look we're, we're smaller than the the hole in the loop there we, we could fit right through the loop of that big giant solar prominence so there are a number of sites you can look at and you can see the sun from the inside out many different ways right on your computer but no matter what websites you visit, remember to keep your heads up.